We have, in the past, investigated the still unexplained, now lost, stonewalling technique, now commonly referred to as polygonal masonry. We have described the incredible feat that this technique involved, the mystery of how an ancient civilization once cut and perfectly fitted together these enormous jigsaw puzzles, sometimes comprised of megalithic blocks weighing many tons in weight. However, we have also covered the coalescence of this polygonal technique with another, which has become known as Cyclopea within Italy, with the Cyclopean walls built upon those by those who possess the ability to create polygonal masonry. All but proving that this Cyclopean technique predated that of seemingly more competent polygonal technique. But just how old these techniques are, or indeed the age of these structures themselves, is now lost to history. However, our next area of interest may shed some light on these sites' considerable age, if you consider the evidence that the site itself presents. Known as the Pelasgic Wall, it is located upon a gigantic, once leveled natural rock within the Acropolis of Athens. The wall, during the time of Thucydides, was claimed to have stood several meters high and six meters broad. It surrounded the entirety of the ruin, with a large visible fragment of the original wall, demonstrating this claimed scale still standing and located upon the southern side, close to the original entrance. Yet today, the beveling can be seen, but the wall has all but vanished, with the foundation of the wall laying below several feet of natural sediment buildup, indicative of a tremendous age. Said to have been built by the Pelagians, hence the name given to the wall, not only does the sediment present at the site suggest a far more tremendous age, but the sheer size of the structure along with the rock it now sits upon that was entirely leveled at some point within ancient antiquity, all points to an ancient feat far beyond the capability of known ancient Grecians, and just like that of polygonal masonry, predictably can be seen at sites just like that of polygonal, which are often surrounded by controversy when it comes to the claim construction and origin of said sites. We logically conclude that these attributions to different groups within known history, easily identified in other locations where these groups never ventured, is solid proof that those who state such false truths know they are indeed being deceptive. It is a ruin which we find highly compelling. We have in the past covered the astonishing ancient high technology still present within the gas-filled lens of Nineveh. Along with this proof of an ancient civilization's knowledge of glass-blowing and convex lens-making, there is seemingly many more examples that have quietly been found, studied, and pushed into the archives of museums worldwide. In particular, those found within the ancient sites upon Crete. Although many a sleuth has discovered this fact, and have subsequently investigated these claims and indeed proofs of an ancient civilization's astute awareness and past ability at creating these perplexing reading lenses, lenses of a surprisingly high quality. The first exposure of this truth came from a most unlikely of sources, that being the July issue of the British Journal of Physiological Optics in 1930, which contained a communication from a Mr. H. L. Taylor in, quote, The origin and development of lenses in ancient times, which ascribes the development of the lenses to the Cretans of 1800 BC. His examination of the museums of the Eastern Mediterranean has led him to the conclusion that ivory and steatite, the materials used for beads prior to 2000 BC, later replaced with rock crystals, onyx, agate, and cornelian. The discovery of the magnification produced by a bead of rock crystal, he believes, led to the production of lens-shaped beads and eventually of lenses such as those of the Royal Gaming Board found in the palace at Knossos, the best of which now rest within the archives of the Museum Candia within Crete. Their magnification ability has been recorded at between 5 and 8 diopters and are plano-convex in shape. 
These quality lenses were then transported out of the area to the mainland, including Troy, Tyre, Nineveh, and the United Kingdom." End quote. However, any explanation as to how these ancient artifacts were indeed created remains unknown, or indeed untold. The closest anyone dare tread is claiming they are of natural rock crystal origins and developed accidentally. Regardless, their existence is undeniably highly compelling. There is a literal smorgasbord of smoking gun ancient architectural anomalies which dot the Peruvian hillsides literally thousands of miles of ruins. With ancient trails stretching far into South America and much farther afield, the largest known ancient artifact ever found is, in fact, a trail just like this. Yet the structures they built still stand as a testament to their creator's abilities, which were indicative of an ancient civilization with abilities and knowledge that mainstream academia seems hellbent in its reluctance to even consider the possibility of their existence. It refuses to even discuss the topic, regardless of the fact that these buildings were made by people who were members of advanced ancient civilizations that somehow became lost within history possibly during a near-extinction-level event. Yet I digress. Our reason for the digression is an intriguing, if limited, post we came across recently, discussing one of the most remarkable, if little-mentioned additions to the most miraculous factors of the ancient Peruvian architecture, most notably its polygonal masonry, which has allowed it to be earthquake-proof for untold ages. It's keying stones, featured in the article, allowing these ruins to just brush off earthquakes, such as the 7.7 .7 on the Richter scale quake that hit Peru in 1950. As mentioned, it was a curious article, and the reason for our fascination and surprise in its existence was the institution responsible for its printing. It would seem in a brazen move just casually covered advanced technology, i.e. keying stones, the institution in question was Cambridge University. Coined as mechanical keying, the article does indeed begin with explaining the stone's miraculous placement and thus their ability to brush off natural disasters, yet predictably just drifts off into another subject without ever attempting to answer the obvious. That being, if these locations were built by the civilizations in which academia, and we should say especially Cambridge agrees, were a primitive people with a primitive knowledge of stone architecture and primitive tools, how did they not only create these keying stones, but the seemingly perfectly cut stones which make up the famous polygonal stonework of ancient Peru? Not to mention the multi-layered megalithic fortress of Sacsayhuaman clearly created by those who built Machu Picchu, but the enormity of the stones they used and the possible reason for this seems too deliberate for it to not have been indicative of some warning. Yet regardless, of each side in particular, their keying stones are a remarkable legacy of a lost civilization, one which we find incredibly compelling. We have in the past covered the fascinating fossilized footprints of apparent ancient giants that may have once roamed our Earth. These prints, undoubtedly of a tremendous age, a timeline and existence which flies in the face of current teachings. Along with these giant prints, we have also touched upon the baffling, seemingly melted handprints found upon stones within Wyoming, yet one area of fossilized prints which have seemingly slipped through our radar until they were recently brought to our attention, is the vast array of extremely ancient human-sized prints found throughout the world. In this segment, we will specifically focus upon those found within St. Louis, firstly due to their remarkable nature, but also due to a curious letter received by a fellow of similar interests, recorded by William R. Corliss in his source book, Volume Strange Artifacts, sent in 1837 by an English geologist. It read as follows, quote, Lest I should again neglect to call your attention to a subject to which I have long since intended to claim your particular regard, I will in this brief space allude to it. In the fifth volume of your journal, 1822, 
There are remarks on the prints of human feet observed in the secondary limestone of the Valley of the Mississippi by Mr. Schoolcraft and Mr. Benton, with a plate representing the impressions of two feet. Ever since my researches on ripple sandstones, published in Jameson's Edinburgh Journal, I felt persuaded the prints alluded to were the genuine impressions of human feet, made in the limestone when wet. I cannot go on with the arguments that may be urged in proof of my opinion, but rely upon it. Those prints are certain evidence that man existed at the epoch of the deposition of that limestone, as the birds that lived when the new red sandstone was formed. Get all the evidence on this head you can, rely upon its most important results will be its consequence. He continued, his fellow friend Sir Woodbine Parrish, who was seemingly an English knight of the realm, was familiar with other prints. Quotes, Tells me of similar impressions which have been seen in South America, and there was a dispute among the top Catholic sects as to whether they were the prints of the apostles themselves. End quote. These mountains of accounts and actual physical proofs that man may be very much older than currently argued, we not only found seemingly overwhelming, but certain individuals' denial of such highly compelling. Discovered in 1860 within the astounding Valley of the Kings, the Atlantis Ring has since proven to have been a most incredible of finds, not only for the secret sacred geometry that was found to have been inscribed upon this seemingly insignificant clay ring, but also for the strange, seemingly reoccurring pattern of curses or good luck talismans wrapped around the entire magic of this once incredible yet now lost civilization. Once discovered, it was said to cast a protective spell upon those who wore it. A supposed positive energy force that although as strange as that of the curse of Tutankhamun, is one that is far less mentioned within the career and discoveries of Howard Carter himself. This, regardless of the fact that it has since gone on to be an incredibly popular mass-produced product, once kept secret for many years by Carter himself. Also now sold under the claim that it does indeed emit a powerful energy field around the wearer. The science behind these claims we cannot claim to understand, However, the ring's modern popularity, along with the lack of coverage regarding this possible legend within the discussion of Howard Carter's career, we have found peculiar. Featuring two triangles, six small and three larger rectangles with a semi-cylindrical form, it was originally found by Marquis de Grain. A blueprint of the ring was soon sent to Carter himself, who made and wore a secret replica which he kept himself until his death in 1939. In 1922, Carter would discover King Tut's tomb. Before opening the tomb, hieroglyphics above the tomb's unbroken seal were read. It said, The wings of death shall touch all who violates the Pharaoh's eternal rest. Unperturbed, they opened the tomb, discovering treasures beyond all of their wildest imaginations. Yet, as warned, all who were involved in this discovery eventually met curious fates, with just Carter himself left, the one person who was undeniably the most guilty party in the entire excavation. He would not die until 17 years later, at the reasonably young age of 66. During these 17 years, however, the flurry of media attention around the claimed curse persisted. Interestingly, Whenever asked how he had seemingly escaped the curse for so long, he would always reply that he had a secret talisman, a good luck charm, that protected him from the curse. This initial cast of the ring Carter had made, it turns out, he seemingly knew of its incredibly important geometric significance. Yet it was not until 1940, while going through his documents, that his studies and indeed rules of wearing the ring were revealed to the world his talisman, a replica of the Atlantis ring. A relic many thousands of years old, originally made from Eswan and clay, like something out of a holy grail story. 
it seems the least valuable, seemingly most conspicuous of finds turned out to be one of the most, if not the most valuable to Howard himself. Out of all the golden wonders he had ever unearthed, this one, one which he didn't even discover himself, he kept closest to his heart. It is because of this that we find the Atlantis ring highly compelling. <laughs>